Episode 12 of Cross Currents is an interview with Raul Pacheco Vega, an assistant professor in the Public Administration Division of the Center for Economic Research and Teaching in Aguascalientes, Mexico. Professor Pacheco Vega visited Memorial University in October to deliver the annual George Story Lecture titled The Market for Human Rights, The Politics of Global Bottled Water Consumption Within a Human Rights to Water Framework. During Professor Pacheco Vega's visit, he sat down with Memorial Professors Arne Keeling and Amanda Bittner to talk about the full range of his interests, including bottled water, pollution, waste, self-care in the academy, and the use of academic Twitter as a tool to promote positivity and kindness among scholars. Welcome to the 12th episode of Cross Currents, a podcast of Memorial University's Nexus Center for Humanities and Social Science Research. A special shout out and thanks to Amanda Bittner and Aaron Keeling for organizing this interview, and to Hans Rollman, Program Director of Memorial's campus radio station CHMR, for technical help and for the use of their studio. I'd like to welcome Dr. Raul Pacheco Vega, uh, who is the, this year's George Story Distinguished Lecturer uh, to Memorial University. Raul comes to us from the uh, Public Administration Division of the Center for Economic Teaching and Research, where he's an assistant professor uh, in Aguascalientes, Mexico. He is a specialist in comparative public policy, focusing on North American environmental politics, especially water and sanitation issues. Very well known for work on bottled water and the issues of the ethics and practices of both the production and consumption of bottled water. He is also very well known for his work uh, on scholarly uh, activism and support networks, uh, research methods and techniques, and social media uh, for academics. He's the founder of the hashtag Scholar Sunday, um, does a lot of work promoting academic writing techniques, etc. on his blog, raulpacheco.org. And we're going to have a nice conversation with Raul about both his research interests, the connections with uh, scholars here at Memorial University, as well as uh, some of uh, his online persona will be revealed. So thanks for coming, Raul. Welcome. Thank you so much, Aaron and Amanda. Yeah, so we're in studio right now with uh, CHMR. Um, F filming, quote unquote, for Nexus. Recording, I guess is the better word. I'm such a podcast newbie. Um, and so uh, me and Arn are in here talking to Raul, which is pretty exciting. And we had agreed before that intro that we were going to do a, a short and sweet intro. And I actually think that it's impossible to do a short and sweet intro for Raul because he's just like like a, a a man of multiple talents and, and wears many hats and has lots of uh, lots of skills. And so I think that was pretty short, Arn. So well done. <laughs> That's awesome. So why don't we just dive into it? I mean, this is meant to be kind of a casual conversation um, for uh, John Sandless's podcast for the Nexus Center at MUN. Um, and so, you know, in trying to think about questions that we could discuss and kind of what things listeners might want to think about or hear about, I want to start actually with just your career trajectory, Raul, if it's okay with you. So you have an academic background in chemical engineering, in economics, in technology management, I don't even know what that is, in political science and resource management. This is a pretty big mix. Um, can you tell us about this route that you've taken, why you took these various directions, um, and then how that has shaped who you are as an academic today? Absolutely. Thank you, Amanda, for the question and Arne for the fantastic introduction. Um, I think the best way to answer that question is that I have been always fascinated with cooperation. That That's always fascinated me. And I, I was telling my mom that as a child, I thought, you know, I'm going to be a professional friend. This will be like what I'm <laughs> I love that. I think actually you are now. Yeah. That, like you've achieved I'm that goal. Sorry. So, I mean, in, in the sense that, you know, friendship is all about cooperation and collaboration and, and, and cross-pollination as well. So in that sense, I think that's what has marked my career, right? Like as a child, I, I wanted to be a professional friend. And then when I did chemical engineering, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to try to focus on ways of protecting the environment, but protecting the environment using collaborative methods. So I did wastewater treatment using a particular specific type mm. of bacteria. And these bacteria collaborated with each other to degrade. That's very cool. Water. So that was my undergrad. And then for my master's, I thought, okay, I'm tired of wastewater. I'm tired particularly of, you know, the aerosol effect, because sometimes, you know, when you're sampling water, you know, water flows and, and, and flies, like there's vaporization. And so you end up drinking wastewater. It's not good for you, trust oh, dear. me. Yeah, so, um, 
Then for my masters, I thought, well, I'm gonna stop, you know, doing wastewater with my hands. I'm gonna be the manager. So I decided to do a, a master's in technology management to, you know, manage research centers okay. and plants and so on. And I would not be the one doing the sampling. I would be the one saying you have to do the sampling. Right. And for my master's thesis, I ended up doing a game theory pro, uh, project where I designed ways in which pharmaceutical companies could collaborate with small biotech firms. Mm. And so this is again a problem of collaboration. Right. And so then I realized, you know, this is not going to make me rich. But you know what's going to make me rich? A PhD. And <laughs> Who's ever said that? Amazing. Oh, <laughs> this was, I mean, famous last words. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought, you know, with a PhD, I may actually end up being, being you know, monetarily uh, better off. So I ended up doing a PhD in resource management and environmental studies, which allowed me to do both political science mm -hmm. and human geography. And for this, I did a specific research project where I focused on how the collaboration between the leather industry and the footwear industry ended up helping them or hindering them in improving their strategies to protect themselves against environmental regulations, changes in land use, and so on. Mm -hmm. So. To this day, I mean, uh, my work is still marked by questions of collaboration, mm. confrontation, cooperation, and so on. Even the work I do on water conflict is focused on questions of collaboration. Even the work that I do on bottled water, I mean, the, the core question that I have is why do we have bottled water? Yes, but why do we have bottled water in a context where citizens are not demanding? really from right. their government. So it's it's a non-collaborative relationship. Yeah. It's a confrontational yeah. relationship. Super interesting. So that's why I ended up going all the way from chemical engineering to, you know, economics and all the way to, you know, political science and, and, and human geography. And, you know, as Arne and, uh, will, will remember, you know, a lot of my work also uses historiographical techniques. Mm -hmm. I, I do, you know, I do multiple methods. I do field experiments. I do quantitative, qualitative, ethnographic, um, spatial analysis, you know, GIS, but also I do a lot of archival work. And this archival work, I think, is, is what has opened me even more to a university like this, like Memorial University, which has such a strong push for collaboration and cross-pollination. Mm -hmm. I mean, here, and, and we discussed this before I was coming. I mean, I was really impressed with the caliber of the scholars that you have here at Memorial University, particularly in the social science and humanities, which is, you know, those are the areas that I'm most familiar with. I mean, it's, you have fantastic scholars in, in areas that are really important, not only for Canada, but mm -hmm. also globally. Yeah, no, it's true. For an island in the middle of North Atlantic, we've got a lot of uh, heavy hitters. We yeah. do all right. We yeah. do all right. And I think departments have really uh, recruited well, as we've, mm -hmm. we've talked about. Yeah. Now, you mentioned the emphasis on historiographical methods. And, you know, we, we were chatting about how you and I used to encounter each other in the microfiche rooms <laughs> in, at UBC, right? The two geeks in the dark corner of Amazing. the library looking at old newspapers and archival materials, etc., why for you is thinking historically about questions like bottled water and sanita uh, sanitation important? I think the, the, the problem is that a lot of us tend to think of public policy problems as problems that only happened in this period, right? Like mm. this, you know, bottled water is only a problem, you know, in the last 20 to 30 years. That's a lie. You know, as I said in my, in my talk, in my, in my public lecture on Tuesday, I mean, Bottled water existed in the 1700s, in right. the 1600s, and it actually existed to do the contrary thing to what's doing right now. I mean, bottled water in the 1800s and 1700s was a mechanism to democratize access to healing waters, mm -hmm. whereas right now, bottled water is a mechanism in, in some ways to prevent the access to the human right to water. So had I not been able to go deep into the historical analysis of bottled water, and you know sanitation and so on, I would be repeating perhaps the same mistakes that you know public policy scholars have done over and over. And this is something that I saw in a cartoon. You know that um, historians are are doomed to like they they always are either doomed to repeat the same mistakes that other people because nobody listens to historians in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. Like. 
But the, the reality is historiographical methods are extraordinarily powerful for many disciplines. This is not just for public policy, as a, and I speak as a public policy scholar, but in geography, in political science, in, um, in other, I mean, the historiographical method really allows you to open yourself up to different perspectives through time. And, and we don't do enough diachronic work. I think we do very, you know, and, and Amanda knows this, right? Like, you know, we do very cross-sectional. This is how we are voting in 2019. This is not like, we don't have much data on how, you know, patterns of voting may have actually, you know, repeated the same policy issues over and over again. Well, and getting those data are, are challenging and the way that we ask questions changes over time and so on. Whereas you can go back to the historical records. I mean, not for every topic and not on everything, but which is exciting, right? You go back to the original source. We can't go back to those original voters and ask them what they were thinking back then, which is, you know, a cry and shame. But what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think uh, questions around purity and risk have always informed debates about water, right? Yeah. Um, and we have those same debates about the, the perception of tap water versus bottled water as being pure, more pure, more healthy, et cetera. And that, that, that extends back into to debates around the, the safety or risk associated with drinking water or with sanitation practices back to the 19th century and earlier. Yeah. And one of the things that, I, that really surprises me when, when I study the politics of bottled water is precisely the question of risk and, and, and the question of the politics of risk, right? Like, because, you know, voters end up numbing themselves to some specific public policy issues. And since you have access to bottled water, you don't have to worry about demanding from a local water utility and a local government, you know, you should be providing me with tap water of good quality. Mm -hmm. And this is happening now. Like we've seen this not only in countries from the global south, but we're also seeing it in countries from the global north. Mm -hmm. We see that there's a numbing and, you know, as long as I have access to good water, mm -hmm. I don't care mm -hmm. if you're having good access yep. to water. So that raises issues of, you know, environmental justice as well. Well, and there's huge disparities even in, you know, developed countries like ours, where some communities do not have good water and others have fantastic water. And it, it's a real problem, this variation. So, but as a non-water expert, can you tell me a bit more about bottled water and like, wh wh what's the big deal with bottled water? Why is it so problematic? What's, what's the problem? So uh, water was assigned in a United Nations resolution in 2012, in 2010, was assigned as a human right. This is a really big deal because, you know, human rights, we had human rights, some, some very basic human rights, like, you know, the right to mobilize within a, within a country, the right to access to education and so on. This is called, you know, a, a third generation sort of human right. These are sort of the, you know, the niche human rights. But having the right to access water actually completely changes your perspective because then you have a right to demand from your government mm -hmm. and from the instances that are important, you know, that they give you access to this water. The problem is that this is sort of an international norm that has not diffused all over the country. So um, in my talk on Tuesday, I, I, I showed how some countries in, in the Americas actually have implemented, you know, the human right to water. Canada is not one of them. Mm -hmm. And this is problematic because that means that there is no legal right. basis for demanding. So you, what you see is, you know, the emergence of um, environmental activists like, you know, the, the Council of Canadians and Mott Barlow and so on, because there is no, because there is no legal recourse mm -hmm. and there is no policy recourse to demand water from uh, the government, you know, activists need to demand it. And in that sense, you know, it's it's sort of a, a complex sort of paradox. You know, how can you make a product out of something that is a basic human right? So it ends up being, you know, this contradiction. And it's mm -hmm. contradictory to see, you know, yes, we want everybody to have access, except, you know, not everybody will be able to have access because we are extracting water from, you know, mm -hmm. um, a reservoir that, you know, communities could be having access to. So um, it's interesting because the bottled water industry will say, well, you know, we're not the ones that consume the most water. We, cons you, we consume less water than, you know, say the agricultural industry. Right. And that's right. But that doesn't mean that there is no risk 
to well, and the agricultural assets. industry is not commodifying water; exactly. it's doing something different. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. It's it's using it for the actual you know process, whereas right. you know the commodification of water. I mean. This is one of the biggest businesses. We were joking as academics that this was just, you know, slightly less profitable than the publication of, you know, journal articles. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although it's interesting because, of course, agricultural industries don't directly commodify water. And yet, you know, scholars have talked about the idea of the trade in virtual water right? mm. because you require yeah. water to conduct large scale agriculture. And if you look at the history of California, for instance, it's a jurisdiction that has essentially completely replumbed its natural aquifers and surface waters, mainly to direct them to large scale agricultural right. producers and away from potentially other uses, you know, think yeah. of Chinatown, etc. But I wanted to follow up on one thing that you you mentioned here and also came out of your talk on Tuesday, because you explored this tension between the idea of water as a commons, a specific kind of commons, as a resource and as a commodity. And I wonder if you could elaborate on this peculiar, multiple, multifaceted status that water has. Um, and, and I wanted to kind of ask whether you think that the human right to water can ever be met by making it property? Oh, right. So this is a very interesting question because questions of property, and particularly property rights, are the ones that drive, you know, research programs, mm -hmm. particularly on, on the access to goods that are subjected to congestion. So goods that are so in the classification of goods, we have private goods, public goods, and goods subjected to congestion. And these goods are, you know, goods to which a lot of people have access. And once you consume them, then they're, they're no longer available for consumption of anybody else. Water, fisheries, forests, land. All well, of those water kind of comes back out eventually, right? Like eventually. <laughs> yeah, you did have the yes, it does. The hydrological cycle. <laughs> I'm being really classy on radio. That's what I do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, eventually, eventually, it does. It does. Right. But again, I mean, the, in 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 a way that is not usable. Yes, So absolutely. The, this relates two questions that are important. One is property and mm -hmm. the, the the property and also value. So you know, a lot of people don't focus on wastewater. And this is one of the reasons why we have studied wastewater, because it's water that has lost the value that right. we were assigning it, right? They, wastewater becomes revalued once you treat it, mm -hmm. not before. Right. And this is interesting as well, because it, it's associated with property. I mean, nobody wants to own wastewater. People right. want to own water or, and treated water and clean water. And that transformation of non-valuable water to valuable water requires intervention of humans. Mm -hmm. And this intervention has implications both for engineering, infrastructure, and so yeah. on. I mean, not a lot of people, have, not a lot of countries and cities have access to the technology to do wastewater right. treatment. And that creates a problem because, yes, water comes back, but water of quality that is not mm -hmm. valuable but also i mean it's water that nobody wants to take property and ownership of mm -hmm. this is what i mean it it becomes what jamie benedictson from university of Ottawa mm -hmm. called the culture of flushing i mean once i flush the toilet right. it's done it's done <laughs> no, but i i don't care right yeah. but the reality is in a, in a hydrological cycle that is closed i mean you can't do that at right. some point it's going to come back yeah. to you yeah. I mean, you mentioned technology, and that actually leads wonderfully into the other question that I had, because, you know, we know that the history of water provision and the water and wastewater treatment has been um, associated with large scale infrastructure, large scale technological networks and the role of the state in, in constructing and then delivering that. Um, is that still the answer to the the uh, provision of the human right to water, especially in rapidly developing cities in the global south? Or is there some more flexible strategies that could potentially be adopted? You mentioned questions of informal water on Tuesday briefly. Is the old school large scale technological network pipes underground and all dams and reservoirs, is that still the best answer to providing safe clean drinking water and the and, and indeed the human right to water so this is a little bit problematic and and you you point out to a really important component of the problem um there's a lot of popularity of in in the last few years 
of very decentralized systems, right? Like, you know, smaller scale at the community level, sort of, you know, wastewater treatment plants or water treatment plants. The problem with decentralized water treatment is that there is nobody that is completely responsible mm. for it, right? So mm -hmm. you assign responsibility to the community. And if there is no institutional memory, then that control of the system disappears once the mm. people who actually were at the beginning were are, are no longer there. So um, what you end up is having to return to the large scale network piped uh, sort of pipe network, right? Um, one of the problems, and we were discussing this earlier, is that there's this, you know, push of governments, and this is, you know, I don't want to assign, you know, blame to neoliberalism as, you know, the the sort of the the answer to everybody's ills, but. You know, there's this push from new public management and, and neoliberal approaches to public policy making that is pushing for cities and governments to do less and less and to the voting and, and you know, inheriting, bequeathing this responsibility to um, private entities. The problem with, you know, transferring control and ownership of water systems to um, you know, private entities is that private entities are interested in profit. They're not interested in serving the public. So that's why one of the pushes that I've done in my work is, you know, pushing for cities and governments to provide for water. I mean, and, and the only way to demand from it, and you better than anybody else knows this, Amanda, as you're an expert in elections, is by voting, right? Like you need to vote for those of, you know, you need to hold on to the power that your vote actually gives you and, and the power to impact decision making and agenda setting as well. Well, I mean, it's interesting too. So from my perspective as a voting scholar, a scholar of elections, I think that they matter. But my colleagues who study public policy tell me that elections don't matter at all. And that what's important is what governments do and kind of the, the kind of path dependence of past ways of doing things and so on. And that the actual policies that we have are very divorced from the election and issues that come from the election and so on, which I get what they're saying. I, I take issue with it. But I mean... I, so let's think about the last Canadian election as a classic example of this, right? Where climate change was an issue that people were talking about. Parties didn't really talk about it that much. Yeah. So did the election, was that was that about climate change? Could there be an election about drinking water that's, that's clearly about drinking water? Or is that just we vote for who we vote for and these issues aren't really issues? And Well, as you saw, Jagmeet Singh actually did have a huge push in his popularity once he said, I want to enable everybody, and particularly First Nations, to have access yep. to drinking water. That right? was a like big he, moment for him, I agree. It is yep. it is a big moment. And I mean, and I completely agree with you. I'm, I'm not a scholar of elections, but as someone who studies, you know, public policy and particularly water policy, I think there are issues that are decided and, and elections that are decided on specific environmental issues. I mean, that was a really big moment and a, and a moment, the moment where he escalated his yeah. popularity. And climate change became an issue. You know, mm -hmm. it, the conservative government was not actually making climate change an issue in, in the election, but the other uh, participants in the election were, yeah. and the other parties were able to bring it up. And also there are elections that are decided and there are candidates who run on specific, you know, very specific issues and water has been one of them. So for example, the most popular um, example of deprivatization, Paris. Paris is an example, the remunicipalization of water supply. You know, Paris had private water supply with Veolia and Sassin Viromont. It became public after one of the mayors the, who was coming from the Green Party, you know, actually made her campaign completely and entirely about returning the control of mm. water to the city of Paris. And she won. Mm -hmm. And Amazing. they were able to deprivatize and, and, and break the contract with Veolia and with, with Suez Environnement. And that's an example of an election that right. was decided yeah. on an environmental issue. So right. it really does matter. I yeah. mean, yeah. And, and at the civic level too, right? Yeah. I think that's, and we, we focus a lot on the big elections as we've yeah. talked about, right? But civic politics is really the arena for these really important infrastructural planning issues, whether it's transport, yeah. whether it's sanitation, water, et cetera. Because it's so decentralized. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, I think about the, 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 again, the history of the electoral politics behind this in the early 20th century. I mean, most of this kind of infrastructure was built 
uh, after bond issuance, which required referenda, right? Mm. So, you, so, so parties or individual candidates at the civic level had to take specific positions around raising funds for this. Right. And it was where a kind of civic dialogue was taking place around what do we want the city to be? What do we want access to these services to be? Who we want to run them? It's the state because that was the that was the tenor of the times that yes, yeah. we need to undertake collective action to provide this kind of stuff. Yeah, and it's a mechanism for state formation as well. I mean, the when you know, when it's interesting because I was actually wondering, you know, whether or not we had the the discipline in in Canada in Canadian political science of you know Canadian political development. But you know, Canadian political development in history is basically state formation, mm. and you know how we end up demanding from the state the services and so on. But I think what you said is very important. The scale at which you know, we end up analyzing problems is super important. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm excited that there is more collaboration between the Department of Political Science and the Department of Geography, because problems change depending on the scale at mm. which you analyze them, right? Like, you know, federal elections are one thing, but, you know, local elections are another thing. And, mm. they, and this change in scale also changes the dynamics of how we look at public policy problems. So, for example, problems of public service delivery. Super interesting. Yeah. So I'm just thinking about our city here in St. John's and the kinds of things that, that it's known for doing well and the kinds of things that it's known for not doing well. And of course, the things that's known for not doing well are easier to come to mind, right? So snow clearing, um, water treatment. I mean, they've just ripped up roads left, right, transit and center and to transit. Absolutely. Mm. Um, these are all like, so let's talk about, you were talking about the commons and, and public goods and things like that. How, how would we classify these things and how can we work these? How how can we do these things better? Yeah, so these are what, what are supposed to be public goods, right? Like, you know, goods that are supposed to be supplied by the state. Now, the problem is that, you know, when we try to solve these issues involving civil society, the state or involving, you know, industry or, you know, public and private entities, what ends up happening is that the government retreats itself. There is a retrenchment mm. process where, you know, the government says, OK, I'm no longer responsible for right. having to deal with, you know, snow plowing or wastewater treatment and so on. We'll find someone who will, you will find a private entity who will want to get the business of, you know, providing, you know, snow plowing or wastewater mm -hmm. treatment or transportation. And the problem is that assigning private entities the supply and and you know the responsibility of supplying a public service makes good no longer public they become private goods and private goods are paid with money and then this becomes a question of justice who has the money to pay for access you know who is going to get access to the services that as a citizen they have a right to have, right? So, you know, yes, I'm a professor, you know, you guys are professors at Mon and you may be able to pay. We're billionaires according to your <laughs> early PhD plans. So <laughs> <laughs> rolling in it. Oh my god. But I it's true that we are pretty we're pretty secure. Yeah. We have good jobs. They pay well. Yeah, but it, what happens with all those people who don't yeah. have the same who don't have the same mm -hmm. kind of jobs, right? Um, and this is why it's important to also instill you know, an ethics and a culture of, you know, who is responsible for providing these services, right? We have, I don't know if this happens a lot at Mon, but we have, you know, very excited students who say, well, you know, I'm going to work in an NGO and we're going to, you know, change the way, you know, water is treated in Mexico. And I say, well, NGOs have a role and I'm very excited about the, the role that civil society has, but let's not give civil society the responsibility that a government should have. Mm -hmm. That's, that's I, I mean, as political scientists, we know that there is a role for the state and we can't preclude them from having the, this role, right? Like we can't just let them off the hook. That's, that's something that I've pushed for a lot in my research. I think there is a role for civil society and I'm very excited about it. And I've studied transnational environmental activism, but I don't think that civil society should be providing, you know, services directly i think there's because civil society where is civil society going to get the money from mm -hmm. 
right? Mm -hmm. If if they get it from the government, then you know there's this risk of regulatory capture. But if they get it from citizens, then you know what do we why do why are we paying taxes? Then mm -hmm. let's yeah. just pay. Yeah. You know, citizens. we can't uh, we can't uh, build uh, large scale infrastructural networks with Kickstarter. Campaigns. Exactly, exactly. Right? right. Although apparently you can do a lot with Kickstarter these you days. You can do a lot with Kickstarter <laughs> these days. <laughs> can fund healthcare, for yeah. example, which oh is outrageous gosh. and drives yeah. me bonkers. In yeah. the in the United States, it's, it's one of the biggest. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's become one of the biggest issues, right? Like, you know, you go to a GoFundMe so that I can get, you know, an mm -hmm. operation. I'm like, well, it's what outrageous. kind of country yeah. <laughs> requires its citizens to have to, you know, ask the world to chip in so that they can have, mm -hmm. you know, proper health care? Yeah, well, it does. It happens here, too, when, when people, especially if they have to travel for specific health care and things. It's happening in Canada as well. So, you know, our health care provision is not evenly distributed. Absolutely. And there's a whole variety of reasons for that. But we maybe don't want to go down the health care <laughs> rabbit hole. I was wondering if we could switch gears a little yeah. bit and uh, talk a little bit about your other persona. And that is as social media doyen and uh, academic writing guru. Um, you gave a wonderful uh, workshop to a very diverse crowd of graduate students yesterday. Uh, you're doing the same today. Um, how did you get into and what motivates you to be so forthcoming and um, engaged in this, the, the world of research and writing techniques? Because it has become, you know, it, it's become a big issue, I think, for students and for current generations of students who, for a variety of reasons, are looking for those kinds of materials. And you're, you're through your blog and through your, your Twitter account and, and, and through these workshops providing an amazing service. So how did you come to recognize the need for that and what motivates you to be involved with that? So at the beginning, I started blogging just because I was bored. I was like, you know, I don't want to do, you know, academic writing anymore. I'm just going to start blogging. But then I realized that by sharing how I did things, mm -hmm. I didn't have, I had a, you know, knowledge base, like a data bank that my students could benefit from, right? Like I wouldn't have to do again the, okay, sit down, let me show you how you do a Google search and then how mm -hmm. you upload these Because you say the same thing over and over and over again to students, right? We yeah. all, we all, mm -hmm. we all learn mm -hmm. the same stuff yeah. over time. And so we get become repetitive. Yeah. So I was like, okay, now I have a knowledge base and mm -hmm. that knowledge base is, you know, you should be reading X, Y, Z and, yep. and W sort of, you know, blog posts of mine. And then, you know, once you know the technique, I can help you with specific problems that you have. See, but the thing is, it has become now, I opened the, the knowledge base to the world and it has become, you know, a reference source and yeah. I'm excited and that motivates me. I, I mean, I've gotten so many emails over the last few years of PhDs who have completed their degrees mm -hmm. and who have said, Dr. Pacheco Vega, I wanted to send you a copy of my dissertation because you are in the acknowledgments of my dissertation. No? Awesome. Thanks to Dr. Amazing. Raul Pacheco Vega for providing a website where I had the guidance that yep. my committee did not give me. Right. Well, and I assign your website routinely to my students because I'm Several like, you need to read do. this. Why would mm -hmm. I write this up for you myself? It's done. Yeah, it's been it's done. done. It's been done. <laughs> do, you, do you think that that speaks to a failure of existing academic training culture, though, that... that uh, again, and not to disparage what you're doing, it's amazing, and you you you've developed all kinds of really but great. But you're like tools. civil society now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like yeah, you've become this you're the this safety net, right? <laughs> Where so is there a lot of bad supervision that you're making up for? I guess to put a fine point um, on it. So I've been traveling a lot and visiting different universities in the last uh, few years, and and one of the conversations that I have with students when I do these kinds of workshops is they're not having a conversation with their supervisors. And that scares me because I don't think supervisors, and particularly, I say this as a Canadian trained, I did, as you know, my PhD, we all did our PhDs at the University of British Columbia. So I felt that I had an ability and a time and a space to talk to my supervisor. But mm -hmm. if I'm coming to Canadian universities where this conversation is not being had, and I mean, I think Canadian higher education is one of the most open to having these conversations between supervisors and students, then we need to change the training and mm -hmm. we need to sort of stop and reflect and see what's happening. So I think there's there's a couple of things. I think there's first a push for a more human and humane approach to doing academia, mm -hmm. which is also opening up the, the whole discussion on, you know, yes, issues of mental health and, and issues of well-being and self-care and so on. 
And I think academics, and, and I mentioned this as colleagues, as, as professors, we are finally opening up to the fact that, you know, we have lives and our lives can get screwed. And so, yeah, you sometimes know, life sucks. It does indeed. <laughs> it, it does. But, you know, you as a professor, would you want to maintain this, you know, facade of nothing's wrong. I don't have a problem. The, you know, I can survive and and then you realize that you have much more of a strong network if you're honest and mm-hmm. open and say, you know, life is sucking right now. So I would appreciate you tweeting, you know, gifts of, you know, uh, puppies, puppies, right? Like because when you you need them, so you always um, need always puppies, need puppy gifts. <laughs> definitely. So in in a sense. Yes, in a sense, I feel that, you know, I am, as, as you said, the NGO, but also I think I'm setting a model, right? Like, because people are replicating yeah. what I'm and doing. And we are, it's true. So I would say that there have been many things that I have learned from you that I now do on purpose yeah. because of things I have learned from academic Twitter and, yeah. and your website in particular. Yeah, Yeah. so I mean, then it becomes a culture, right? Like, it Absolutely. no longer... It, I no longer have to convince norm people. change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's norm change. <laughs> I mean, I no longer have to convince people that you know it is important to have a conversation right. with their students because they see that you know students are are reactive. Um, what I find interesting, and I and I wanted to you know emphasize this also on the podcast is the emphasis on inputs rather than outputs, right? Like you know this um, this perception that you know, reading is not mm. writing, mm-hmm. you know, actually, on the contrary, they, this focus on output rather than input, right. right? Like, you know, you should be writing, you know, 1500 words, words a day. Yeah. And I'm like, um, I'm very happy with, you know, having my notes and having been able to actually read and understand and mm-hmm. so on. And I, I actually value the time that I have to just write notes in my everything notebook and, and just this is something that I thought, right? Like, you know, for my for my lecture on Tuesday, I was able to think for six hours on bottled water, what right? A luxury. Like, six yeah. hours. It was a luxury yeah, just yeah. to sit down yeah. and read and look at my slides and reread the literature and read my own writing and mm-hmm. see like, wow, I had six hours of full <laughs> undivided attention to a topic. So I think we need to reclaim it, and and R and I were commenting, we need to reclaim the slow scholarship, but mm-hmm. it's also reclaiming it as, you know, a norm, but as a norm that can be accepted globally, right? Like, you know, where no it's not a norm just in the gender uh, and politics lab or in the toxic legacies project. It's it should be a norm all over the world. Right, like. Well, and this, I mean, I think this is a thing that I struggle with a lot, right? So I think that as academics, we think that our job is research, right? But in actual fact, research isn't the bulk of my job, right? It's not even half of my job. Um, you know, once you add in teaching and other kinds of, you know, service kind of responsibilities, committee work, you know, designing program changes and things like that. Um, and so one of the problems that I struggle with, and I, I know that this is an internal struggle, and so I'm trying to just change the way that I think about this, mm-hmm. is that I don't feel like I've done any work unless I have done research work, which yeah, includes yeah. reading, which I have very little time for, sadly, um, and includes writing and includes data analysis and coding and all that kind of stuff. But if I'm doing anything else, I don't count it as work, but yeah. I, 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 I labor for hours on other yeah. things. And you right? still come home exhausted. Exactly. <laughs> it's work. And so how do we change the way that we think? So not only to protect the research time, which I struggle with as well, but also to pat ourselves on the back when we've worked for eight hours and just not done research that day. Like, yeah. how, how do we do this I, I think one of the biggest issues and, and and this challenge that i struggle with as well is just recognizing that we do work that is varied and multifaceted and so on sitting down and talking to students who are struggling with mm-hmm. their program is work is work and important yeah. work yeah. Yeah. yeah but i mean it comes back also to the reward structure of the university right, right? Yeah. so the rewards are counted in, and and blessedly we are not affected that much here by impact factors and citation counts. But in general, still that level of productivity mm-hmm. is measured number one and at the top by one form of scholarship yeah. versus yeah. all these other forms of scholarship, academic community building, etc. Yeah. And this is interesting that you mentioned this because, I mean, the reality is, I mean, getting forty thousand followers on Twitter is not going to get me tenure. But being able to see how my Twitter, you know, pushing for 
a more humane mm -hmm. human academia, pushing for having, you know, resources all over the world and, and sco more scholars getting involved in producing these resources, right? Like, do you know, there's people like Jessica Calarco at University of uh, Indiana University of Bloomington. There's people like Tania Golash Bosa at University of California Merced. Like there's so many other people who are now saying, oh, wow, you know, Raul is doing this. Maybe mm -hmm. I should do this mm -hmm. for first generation students right. or for, yep. you know, students who are speaking Spanish as their first language and English as a second language, right? Mm -hmm. So this is sort of a virtual circle and I like that virtual circle. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I'm much more rewarded personally and I feel much more rewarded by knowing that people have felt that my work, my Twitter, my, you know, blog and so on have helped them. Mm -hmm. you know? Oh, well, without a doubt. I mean, yeah. I have benefited personally from your academic Twitter and your blog and your website. Um, but I, I want to, so I guess, push you on this a little bit because like Twitter isn't always the best. Right now, academic Twitter is usually pretty good, although there have been moments in my the last year, let's just say, where academic Twitter was not my friend. Yeah. But um, it generally is my friend and it generally is one of the reasons that I put up with other trolls, yeah. you know, who aren't academics usually. Um, but what are the sacrifices? Like, what are the what are the risks that being out there on on Twitter as an academic um as a person who's pretty upfront about your personal life, about some of your struggles that you've had and so on, like, do you get pushed back? Like, what, what does that look like? I mean, I especially with 40,000 almost followers, like, that's a lot of people who can comment on your Twitter feed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this has happened to me, which is very bizarre. Um, I've had pushback on a number of things that you would be like, how can you get pushback, right? Like, you know, um, I have had pushback on why is Scar Sunday happens on Sundays. And I'm like, well, because there is no other day where you could talk about scholarship, right? So, you know, you end up, you know, there's there's Saturday School, which is another hashtag that was founded by Rhonda Ragsdale at University of Houston. And I didn't want to, you know, impose on her mm -hmm. hashtag. So I chose Sunday and I was like, well, this is going to be the day when we promote other scholars, right? So I got pushback on that. I got because you should back. be working on the weekend? Like, that's the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, you know, I got pushback on the... And, and this is really interesting. I got pushback on the issue of using doctor as part of, you know, my uh, Twitter account. Yeah. And, you know... Um, because and, it's elitist? Is that uh, why? Exactly, or? because it feels like, you know... Uh, first generation students will not be able to address me and so on. And I mean, there's a very hierarchical view of, you know, how we do naming and so on mm -hmm. in, in, in academia, right? Like, you know, you are Professor Pacheco Vega, you are Dr. Bittner, you are, you know, Professor... Just good old Arn. Right? <laughs> I'm, I'm good but, with that. The, but the thing is, uh, there's there's a level of respect that emanates and that comes out of, you know, the, the title, right? Like, you labored for six, seven, eight years to get a PhD. You know, you have a right, you earned a right to be called doctor, right? So Well, I, and then also different individuals get called that by default while others don't, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. And then this is not random. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, you get uh, Dr. Killing and then you get Amanda, right? Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. you both have PhDs. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, there's this whole other conversation and, and this got me into trouble with Australians who, Australians are very much on a first name basis and I was like well right. I'm not on a first name basis with everybody so please don't do that right so, yeah. Um, but yes yeah, so I mean even academic Twitter has been nasty to me at some point right like but the way in which I see it is sometimes you just need to take a break and I've taken breaks from you know Twitter itself and academic Twitter overall and I think the best way to think of Twitter is as a community building tool, but it is a tool, mm -hmm. right? Like, I mean, life on Twitter is not life on Twitter. We, like you and, and Arn and myself, were friends before we were on Twitter, right? Like, you, we were friends in grad school. So as long as you can maintain this sort of, you know, realization that, Twitter isn't everything, mm -hmm. then you, you can just... Although I would say too, that. like, yeah, I mean, there's friendships that can translate into the digital world, but then there's also some friends that I've made purely digitally, who I then yeah. meet in person, yeah. and I'm like, I love you. Yes. I lo it's like a love fest, but I yeah. would never have met this person had it not been for Absolutely. Twitter. And so Absolutely. I'm grateful for that too, because yeah. I think over the last couple of years in particular, there have been some challenges that 
people who I have never met have helped me through, and yeah. I am grateful for that as well. Yeah, it's a it's a really what, cool. What about for students? I mean, again, the the Twitter world, you know, and and engaging in social media, especially in terms of research, but also networking, etc., comes with particular pitfalls. I know a student of mine, for instance, um, had uh, his research attacked over. A tweet, a tweet that he had posted online about a, a, an issue that was maybe somewhat tangentially related to his research, and um, you know we've been discussing in our department a kind of you know protocol first for, response yeah. slash protocol for when colleagues get research gets attacked, which we know has a set of equity and inequalities built into whose research gets attacked and who doesn't, yeah, it's not random. how we support each other online, and then the particular vulnerabilities of students online. Mm-hmm. So when yeah. you think about talking to students about engagements with Twitter, academic Twitter, but inevitably academic Twitter is not firewalled. Yeah, yeah. It is open to the world. I mean, what, what sort of considerations do you bring to bear? So I, I do that exactly with my students, right? Like I say, you should probably have a private Twitter account until you finally feel like you can open yourself up. And there's a number of people who, you know, routinely make their, their account private. I, my account is public and, and I and I have just coped with the fact that it's public because I have 40,000 followers right. on Twitter, right? And so, I mean, and also my tweets sometimes are the basis for blog posts that mm-hmm. I write. So I can't really shut them down. Uh, but there, there's a number of kits of first response in social media, particularly for when students and colleagues get attacked. Um, People at conditional, uh, conditionally accepted. Conditionally accepted is a website that was mm. started by Dr. Eric Grohlman. Uh, Dr. Grohlman is uh, queer and he's also a scholar of color. He's African American, if I recall correctly, and he developed sort of these beginning guidelines to how you protect yourself because there have been, you know, women of color and and you know, women in general get attacked a lot more on Twitter than, Absolutely. you know, men. It, it, a this lot is a more. reality. So. About random stuff. Yeah. Very <laughs> random, very random. And I mean, this has been demonstrated even in scholarly research. Mm-hmm. So um, Conditionally Accepted has developed sort of this first kit, you know, and one of the things that they recommend is, you know, just don't engage the troll and don't, if necessary, mute, mute the conversation, mm-hmm. mute the person and so on. And that's what I've done. I mean, a lot of the work that I do is just muting people. And mm-hmm. it's, um, a lot of people say, well, you should probably block because blocking precludes them from accessing you know your own network and not trolling your friends and so on but it really the problem with twitter is that the platform evolves so much that any sort of strategy that is based on the technological capabilities of the platform will fail eventually because tomorrow jack dorsey is going to decide that you know no matter how my, how many people you block on twitter you know you're going to still have to have an a a public account, right? So he he's uh, I, and and I hope he doesn't listen to this podcast. But he's crazy in that sense, right? Like you know, he he seems to have this bizarre idea that the more open, the better. Same as Mark Zuckerberg, and you know, there's it, it's important to also be closed. And in some ways, a lot of people say, "Well, you're very very public," and I say, "Well, I'm public in the issues that need to be public, right? Like you know, I'm private in the issues that I need to be private, but." I'm not private about the fact that I've been struggling with dermatitis and with, you know, other health challenges because I think that needs to be destigmatized as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, we are sometimes healthy and we are sometimes not very healthy. So, mm-hmm. uh, but this is an issue of control. And I think the more control you have over your social media persona, the better it is. And, mm-hmm. you know, for students, I would always recommend to maintain and sustain mm-hmm. control. Yeah. Do you do you ever wade in on behalf of students or colleagues when you see their attack? I mean, what's your sort of protocol on that? So what I normally do is, yes, and but I, I do it in a way that doesn't engage the troll, right? Like, so I okay. say, well, you know, I really believe that Dr. Bittner has demonstrated her, her scholarship in, you know, elections and political behavior. And this is the kind of work that I like the most about her. So I diffuse the attention from the troll and I focus on the scholarship that particular scholar it, who is being under attack uh, is, is doing. It's really hard because, you know, you end up having to do what is called subtweets, right? Like, you yeah. know, basically yeah. sending something, um, you know, I, I, I know exactly with which which moment in last year you were referring to, Amanda. And I sent a subtweet 
Yes, and you did. And I was grateful. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of people were like, how did you dare? And I'm like, because I had to. I mean, this is... Th this is also part of what makes Twitter so peculiar, right? Like, you need to show support publicly, right? Like, you know, Amanda knows that we're very good friends and I support her all the time, but I had to make my support visible and visible in non-certain terms, right? Like, you know, saying, this is wrong, you're doing it wrong, and what the hell are you doing, yeah. right? Like, so when I sent that subtweet, everybody who had gone through the whole discussion and so on they got it yeah and they were like oh like you know should maybe i shouldn't have said yeah. what i th what i said and i said yes that's why you need to think first and then yeah. tweet later I mean, right? we all react and all of us i think have been guilty of you know tweeting before thinking yeah um and so but that experience that i had got me thinking about my own habits and, and change some of the things that I do. Because all of us have done a quick, funny tweet that we yeah. think is just hilarious, but actually is causing harm. Mm -hmm. um, but I was grateful for like the public outcries, like your subtweet. But I was also, it was remarkably interesting to me to have the number of kind of DMs that I received from people I didn't know, mm -hmm. emails that I received from people I did know, people that I thought were not really like supportive colleagues before that were really really kind and supportive and so it was like oh wow what's going on right now yeah. meanwhile others who i thought were supportive colleagues were really really not and so yeah. that experience made me a bit more wary of relationships both yeah. online and offline um but also just like i mean it, it i don't regret it. i would do the exact same thing all over again because in retrospect it's now been like whatever six months eight months it's funny yeah. at the time it was in no way funny <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean... See, and under the eyes of my students, too, who are watching this, right? So yeah. the students are watching this take place in public. Yeah. And so watching my reactions in public, watching yeah. other reactions in public, and like... So part of this is modeling, right? How yeah. do you be a kind and also involved communicator? How do you not be a jackass? Sometimes it's hard to not be a jackass, but... It it's yeah. easy to be reactive, right? It is. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, the thing is, you end up, and I think you both have managed to do this in, in a very smart way. You both have managed to have a Twitter presence that is scholarly, but also human. And I think that's the one thing that I always recommend to my students and colleagues who say, I want to get on Twitter. What do you recommend? Be scholarly, but be human. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, of course, people who follow me want to know about, you know, the human right to water and they want to know about, you know, the best technique to do lead reviews and so on. But sometimes, you know, I just want to know yeah. the best soup. By the way, I, you know, have not seen any, fr you know, Greek restaurants in St. John's. I was very surprised. And I, you know, there are a couple. There are? There are. Just yeah, not downtown and, and, right and I mentioned this because, you know, the other day I, I said on Twitter. You feel like some souvlaki right now. I can see what's no, happening. No, 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 no. <laughs> Funny. I, I, I thought about, I, I sort of wanted, you know, orso salad. And I was mm. like, you know, I want orso salad. Send me your recipes. And you would be amazed how many scholars mm. will actually email you back and say, Hi, so this is my recipe for I, I requested soups one time and I and, and I, I think I sent people, you a soup. Yeah, I mean I love know. soup. And and people but people will react yeah. so people tend to react the way you portray yourself, right? So if you say, Hi, I'm a human who happens to be a professor, right? And right now I want all the best recipes for soup, people will react mm -hmm. with you know, soup. But people will also send you, you know, the latest journal article in the AJPS who on soup. you do not <laughs> No, but you know, in the topic that yeah, you're yeah, that yeah. you're doing. So, you know, it it really is all about being human and being a good human, I think. And I, I actually think that both of you have managed to do that, even though your Twitter accounts, you know, are very much focused on the scholarly component, but also the personal component is, I think it's very important as well to never forget that we are humans and, you know. Yeah. Amanda's got the gift game, though. Gifts uh, are my friend. Re Toxic yeah. Legacies does not have a gift game. <laughs> we could work on your, your gifts, though. Oh, I think that would be... Super low gift. I do game. think that uh, you've been a really good role model for all of us, though, about how to be human and how to be kind and how to be supportive, but also how to set boundaries and things like that. And so I, I'm grateful to you for that. I feel like this is probably a good time to stop. Um, yeah, I think we've kept both Hans and uh, Raul for an hour. So yeah. um, thanks again for doing this, for coming to Memorial University, for being the George Story Lecturer. 
Um, it's been amazing to see you again so and great. to see your contributions to yeah. students, to our fellow faculties of across humanities and social sciences. So. Thank you, and, and thank you to the Nexus Center. Thank you to the Department of Political Science. Thank you to the Department of Geography. Thank you to the George Story um, Distinguished Lecture Program and Memorial University. I, I am so grateful to just have had this opportunity because the reality is sometimes you forget that there is a world out there, right? Like, you know, that there is um, a, a world of scholars who are also amazing human beings. And, you know, having this opportunity not only to reencounter ourselves as professors, not as grad students, but also to be able to interact with the Memorial University of Newfoundland, you know, faculty it has, I'm, I'm amazed. I mean, Josh Leposky and Max Liborian and, you know, Isabel Cotti and, uh, you know, it's, there are so many scholars that Sarah Martin, and it's, it's just so amazing to see that there are so many scholars that are fantastic at mm -hmm. Memorial University. It just, we're pretty lucky. Yeah. 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 And you, and you pumping our tires here. Yeah. Yeah. I, we, don't we stop talking. Yeah. Why would I just be <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much again for yeah. the invitation. Thank you okay. so much. Bye-bye. To find out about future episodes of Cross Currents, you can follow us on Twitter at Nexus Center, search up the Nexus Center Facebook page, or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or YouTube. The music used in the podcast was licensed under a Creative Commons license, and you can find out more about the music on our show notes. The Nexus Center is generously supported by the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences and the Vice President's Research Office at Memorial University. The next episode will continue with our series of talks from the Environmental Humanities and the Public Realm Workshop. We'll see you then.